Welcome to an introduction to Scandinavian church records. This is the second part in a three-part series. My name is Jenny Hansen. I'm an accredited genealogist and I specialize in research in Scandinavia. RootsTech has asked me to make you aware that the contents of this video include my thoughts, my views, my opinions. They do not necessarily reflect the views of FamilySearch or of RootsTech. In the first part of this series, we talked about some introductory topics. We included the concepts surrounding a state church. We looked at some handwriting samples and we talked about the ways that dates were recorded. In this session, I want to introduce you to what information you can expect to find in the church records themselves. Church records in Scandinavia are some of the best. As I mentioned in part one, we'll start seeing these records as early as the mid 1500s. That being said, most church books start in the 1600s and some only start even later than that. But these records are available until quite recently. Privacy laws vary for each country, but you should be able to see any records that you need for your ancestral lines. The earliest church records were written out in what I call long form by the parish clerk. While he was given some parameters to follow regarding the information that needed to be kept, the style of keeping those records was entirely up to the clerk. Some kept a chronological list of every event as they happened. Others kept all the records organized by event type, all christenings together, all marriages together, etc. Until you get into the records, you won't know how they were organized. It's like a little surprise waiting for you to discover what those records will actually look like, and you just don't know till you get there. But beginning in the early 1800s, the federal governments for each of the different countries determined they wanted more regulation on what information was gathered. Printed forms were created for the clerks to fill out. These are awesome because we know what type of information we're going to get. We know what to expect in each column. These are far more easy to navigate. And the good news is we usually start out our research in these forms because we work from the known to the unknown. Also, these column headings can be found a few different places online one of which is on the Family Search Research Wiki. So if you do a Google search for Norwegian church record headings or for parish register translations, you're going to be able to find help for reading the different column headings. The events included in the church records are listed here. They include christenings, confirmations, engagements or marriages, burials and incoming or outgoing lists. The three that I have here in bold are always included in the records, and you'll notice that they correspond to the three main vital events that we hope to find for every family member. So let's look at each of these in more depth. Christenings took place shortly after the birth of an infant. This picture of a christening font is in one of my ancestral parishes in the far northern end of Denmark. I love looking at that and thinking of the significance that that old crusty christening font has for my family. Typically, the child was christened within a few weeks of being born. Sometimes we'll see an infant christened in the home the days immediately following the birth. On rare occasions, we see a child christened several months after their birth. If they were christened in the home, they might also be christened in the church. These are some of the little complexities that come that we just don't know what we're going to find, but the records make it pretty clear what happened. The records will always contain a few key details. We will see the child's name, we'll see the parents' names, although sometimes the parents' name really just means the father's name. Moms get excluded from these sometimes. We get the date of the christening and we learn the name of the godparents or the witnesses. So many of the records, especially those listed in the forms in the more recent years, include the birth date as well as the christening date. We'll get the name of the town or the farm where the family lived and we'll get an occupation for the father, kind of a descriptor of who this family was in the community. While I don't think that we could ever find a traditional birth record like we think of today, christening records provide plenty of information to supply us with the facts that we need to be able to extend our family lines. So here's an example of a christening record from the forms. Let's zoom in and take a closer look at what this record actually says. It's a little bit kind of on the faded side, but you know, old records, that's what you get. This christening record states that the child was born the 15th of August. His name was Anders Christensen. 
The handwriting's pretty straightforward. The only thing that you need to watch for on that name is that elongated S for sin. Uh, the next column tells us the date of the christening. It says that the 17th of November in the church, the christening took place. So many times this column might indicate the christening was in the home or if there was a christening in the home and in the church, it would be noted here and have both dates. The next column tells us the parents' names. So this one reads the cottager, that's Hoosman right there at the top, and the bricklayer, which is Murmester, Christian Peterson, and his wife, that's Kona, Anna Anders' daughter of Bean. Now we have the name of both the parents for this family. The next column is gonna tell me the witnesses and the godparents. And the following column is the clerical notes, that one, six, one. Uh, the last column tells me the date that the mother was introduced back into the church. So this was about six weeks following the birth and it goes along with the whole line of thinking of unclean and clean. There was a ritual that the mother had to go through to prove herself clean enough to be back at the church. This date reads the 17th of October, so kind of two months about after the birth of the baby. We got some great information from this record and it wasn't all that difficult to read either. So next I wanna show you one of those earlier christening records that predates those beautiful forms that I love. We'll zoom in a little bit closer. This priest had written everything down in chronological order. So this record starts out with the date written as a feast day. It says Sunday the third past Epiphany. So I need to go look for that date using a feast day calendar like we talked about in part one of this series. So let's keep moving on. I see that the father's name was written in an abbreviated style. So this is really common. You'll become familiar with the common abbreviations as you work through the record groups. And it seems like every clerk kind of had their own abbreviations that they worked with but some go across the board. So this name reads Christian Peterson Norgard, a very common abbreviation for any name that starts out with Christ, meaning like Christian, Christina, etc., things like that. That Christ could be uh, formed by just making an X for the abbreviation. So you'll also see a really good example of patronymics mixed with a farm name on this name. Christian Peterson, which is super familiar, right? Lots of Christian Petersons around there. But by putting his farm name of Norgard at the end, we determine which Christian Peterson this is. So Christian Peterson Norgard. The record does not list the name of the wife, but like I said, sometimes that's just how it goes. The next piece of information says that this child was christened and called Lena, and that should take us right to the beginning of that second line if you're trying to follow along. It continues by saying that the child was carried by Loritz Thugesen's wife, and then it lists the name of the witnesses. We have Peter Smith, meaning Peter the Smith, Christian Thugesen, Anders Thugesen, and Niels Thugesen's wife, all from Tisted. Look at that name of the witnesses. I'm very confident that that Thugesen family is important. And my initial guess is that the mother to baby Lena likely has the surname Thugesen's daughter. Further research is gonna prove or disprove my hunch, but in either way, I care about that family. Even though this record is not as neat and tidy as the first one that we looked at, we still got really good information. The writing is a little bit harder to decipher, but it's not terrible. This is a really complete record, and I'm thankful that I have this much information in a christening. So the next records we're gonna look at is confirmation records. Confirmations took place within the Lutheran church around age 14. It's usually close to 14, never really earlier than that, but sometimes I've seen it clear up to 18 or 19. Those are kind of the exception. 14, 15 is the norm. This was a time when young people were tested on their knowledge of the catechism. It was required that everybody be tested. The children would attend catechism classes taught by the priest to prepare for those confirmation. It was a big deal and everybody did it. In the early church records that predate the use of the forms, we often don't even see records of confirmation included. But if they are included, that information is pretty limited. You might just get a list of names of individuals who were tested on that particular day, but nothing else. However, the form records, we're going to learn the name of the parents and the parish where the kid was christened. 
So these records become helpful for young people who were not living at home during the time of their confirmation. And it was also really common for teenagers to be living and working outside of their home at that time. So let's look at a confirmation record and maybe you can understand more of what I'm talking about. You can see that this form gives us a nice predictable table of information. Let's zoom in and take a closer look at what this contains. This page is for the confirmation of females. It says that right at the top, confirmed girls. So most church books are divided up by gender. I don't know if I mentioned that earlier. The year is also written on the top of the page. You can see in that top left corner, it says 18, and then the priest is filled in 51, 52, and 53, which would all fall on this page. The confirmation date would be listed at the beginning of the list for this group, so it's gonna be on the previous page. But the most common Sunday, I'll just throw this in as an interesting side bit, the most common Sunday for confirmations is the week following Easter or Quasimodo Sunday. So again, a feast day calendar would help you determine the exact date for your records if you don't have that written in by the clerk. The first column gives us the number of that individual on the list, and then the next column gives us the subject's name. So the first one on this list here is Meta Kirsten Anderson of NIM. So by this time, the mid 1800s, surnames were becoming more regulated. All the patronymic names ended in son. You didn't see any new kids being born with daughter being added to them. Um, the next column is gonna ask for the name of the parents and give information about them. So this one states that the father is the cottager or the hoosman, Anders Anderson from Brond. His wife is Marianne Lars' daughter. They lived on a farm in Nim, which is this tiny, beautiful rural parish. The second page tells me that the child's birth information. Notice that it says that she's originally from Torp and not from Nim, which is the parish we're working in. So we're seeing the next column, the common notation of the catechism resuscitation. So everybody on the page had the same notation and basically translated, it says something to the effect of nicely done and very good. So we next column find information about their smallpox vaccination. This was required for everybody. I haven't ever really found this to be useful in my genealogical research, but it is interesting to note when this vaccination took place. The final column is for clerical notes, and that's not anything that's going to appeal to me today. Let's talk about marriage records. Marriage records are the next vital record in the church books. You may see an announcement of the marriage or like an engagement, or you might see the bands being read in the church, or you might see a record of the actual marriage, or you might see a combination of all of these. Again, it kind of depends on what the clerk was recording. Whatever date that you get from the church books will be great to include in your records, even if the marriage date is going to be based on the marriage bands being read in church. So the marriage records, whatever the format, will tell you the names and the residences of both the bride and the groom. In the later form records, you'll see lots of great additional information, including a birth date and place, the name of the father, the occupation, and even more information. This first record is a sample image from a form marriage record. So you can see the record covers two pages. Let's take a closer look at what this marriage actually includes. All right, the first column that I selected is a record telling us about the groom. He was described as the bachelor Peter Peterson, meaning this is his first marriage. He's the son of the cottager named Peter Simonson from Brovst Parish. He was 29 years old. He was born the 5th of August of 1812 and vaccinated the 7th October of 1814. And he was working in Nora Sunby, which is the name of the parish where this record was written. The next column tells me about the bride. She was a single woman named Marianne Thomas' daughter, the daughter of Thomas Sultan and his wife who lived in Norox town, so the same town. She was 23 years old and also from Brofs Parish. She was born the 10th of August, 1818 and vaccinated the 6th of August, 1820. She also lived and worked in Nora Sunby. The second page starts with the name of the bondsman or the witnesses to the marriage. These are going to be people that matter for our research. So it shows Lars Christensen Kroll and Peter Sorensen. 
The marriage took place on the 5th of December, 1841 in the church. So we see some clerical notes next, and then that final column gives me the dates that the bands were actually read in church. The first time was the 14th, the second time the 21st, and the final the 28th of November. So we see these three weeks preceding the date of the marriage. What a great record. So we can go back and find both individuals christening records based on this one record. We know the names of the fathers. We've got great information to jump back another generation based on anything that's just in this one marriage record alone. Okay, here's an early marriage record. This one has a lot trickier handwriting, but I want you to try to follow along with me. It's actually not as difficult as you might originally think when you look at this. It starts out by saying the 21st of April, 1809, to be married or till egg scab, the widower, that's Anchorman, Peter Simonson of Sondrox, which is a town. It goes on to say the single woman Marin, Peter's daughter, from Langesloon. So that wasn't too hard. We just had to move slowly over the letters, looking for the names and the places. It finishes out by telling us the witnesses, or Forlova, were Gregors Nielsen and Christian Simonson, both from Sonderox. So we don't get nearly as much information here. We don't know about the fathers. We don't know about the christening dates for these people but we still learn the names of both the bride and the groom, and we know their original places of origin. And I'm also gonna note that Gregors Nielsen and Christian Simonson must be important if they're serving as the bondsmen. There's good information to move on with just what we found out in this record that's really brief. The next record group to watch for is the burial records. Remember that these are burials and not deaths, but the information for these records will totally suffice for your death information in your personal research. We will always get the name of the individual and almost always we get some type of the description for how they fit into the community. Here is an example of the forms for a burial record. Of course, none of us can read this, so we need to zoom in closer. This record is for the deceased males in this parish. The first column tells me the date of death, the 28th of January, 1885. The second column tells me the date of the burial, the 3rd of February in Brothst Churchyard. The deceased name is Niels Christian Jensen. The second page starts out with a description of Niels. It states that he was a married brick mason and a cottager of Sondrox and born in Torlev, which is a neighboring parish. He was 35 years old when he died. The final column is just for the notes. So before we get into that, I just wanted to talk about what information we found so far. We have an age at death and we have a good solid uh, parish for where he was born. So with this, we could estimate a birth year for him and go look for his christening records. But let's look at the final column on this one for the notes. A lot of times this column is left blank, but if it's not blank, it is worth noticing. These will tell us about the death. This record can be super interesting. This one in particular is great. So this one reads on the 27th of January, remember his death date was the 28th of January. So this says the 27th of January, a tree fell onto his left side and killed him. This is great information to have if Niels is your ancestor. I frequently see different illnesses written in this column. Sometimes it states that the person was just old. I've even seen a record that states that the individual drank himself to death. I also recently just saw one that said um, it had two sisters listed right next to each other in the burial record. And it said that these sisters had been drinking arsenic together. These are such interesting records. So always pay attention to notes if they have some in that column. I wanna look at this early burial record. While I'm sure that you are starting to see the patterns in these different records, I just want you to see that even when the page looks like a disaster, like this in front of us, it's not all a lost cause. So we're gonna zoom into one entry in the middle of this page and let's read it together. This record begins by saying on the 26th of May, and then it goes ahead and gives the feast day. Well, we already know the date, so let's just skip over the feast date today. That's not going to be that important to us. We know that this date was the 26th of May. 
And then let's keep skimming along until we bump into a name. At the end of the first line, I see Peter. And then on the next line, it says Simonson. So Peter Simonson's wife, Kirsten, to bear or was buried. And then you see that GL, GL. That's an abbreviation for Gamla or for age. It says she was aged 42. That's all that we're going to learn from this record but we have a date, we have a relationship, we have an age that's going to allow us to calculate a birth year. So great information. I'm totally content with this record and I feel like I can progress with what I have. The later form records contain a section of moving lists. These note anyone who moved in or out of a parish. The records state where they originated and where they were heading. Our ancestors were required to inform the church of their whereabouts so that it was clear which jurisdiction was responsible for their welfare. It also allowed for a solid count of who was living where for military service. So when you have these records available, they of course are really helpful for trying to trace an ancestor's movements from one parish to another. But if you don't have them, it's gonna be okay. Here's an example of an incoming list. It just shows this big register of names. The second column tells the individual's ages, and then it asks for an occupation, and it asks where they came from, and then it's followed by a bunch of clerical notes. Similarly, the outgoing lists. These list an individual leaving the parish. It asks for the age, and unsurprisingly, you might notice that most of the people on the move are young adults. It also asks for the name of their sponsor or who's going to be receiving them in their new residence and it asks where they are going to. So clerical notes will follow again. I just wanna remind you that these column headings can be found online, so there's no need to worry about memorizing all the information I'm spewing to you now. You can always find help in places like the Family Search Research Wiki or even just doing a search for, let's say, Norwegian Parish Register's outgoing list, and you can find the column headings there. There's one more record group that we need to touch on, and it's gonna make all of us wish that all of our heritage was Swedish. In Sweden, there's a record called the Household Examination List. These were a list of every household within a parish. They were created to track household involvement in ritual, or excuse me, household involvement in church rituals, like the communion. Each home was also annually tested on the catechism. So the priest would go to each home at some point during the year test the family, and document all the information about them. Through these records, we get a really great summary of the events that were going on in each family. Full birth dates are noted for everybody, deaths and marriages are added in there. If a family moved to a new parish, that's indicated. If someone died, their names crossed out, and that's indicated. These records begin in the mid 1700s, and every record covers a series of years. So there were no forms for these records until like the 1860s, but then the information is pretty consistent throughout all of the years. When one series ended, a new series was created. So that we kind of have this common stream of these household examination lists going on for a really long period of time. Sweden does not have a traditional census record, but these household examination lists more than compensate for it. This is a part of the church record collections. Here's just one example of a household examination book. This is from the later years to give you an example that's a little bit easier to read. So these books are kept on the parish level because like I said, they're part of the church books. They're organized by the communities within each parish. So you'll see a town name listed at the top of the page and then every family living in that little town is detailed. This record is for Johan Lind's family. He is a cottager or a hoosman he was born in 1804 on the 4th of July. You see columns for the notes about his church participation. And as you move down the list for his family, you can see his wife, there's two sons, three daughters, complete birth dates are given for everybody. And if anyone in this family had died, the name would be crossed out and a burial date would be written on that page. If anyone married, the spouse's name would be noted with the marriage date and where that couple was gonna go live. These are just the best records. They're so easy to use, they're relatively easy to read because they're all in charts, even the early ones that were done before charts were published, they were still made into these nice tables. They're just exceptional records 
and they were also made by the same person who was keeping track of all the clerical information within the church anyway. So they're very accurate and they line up really nicely with the christenings, the marriages, and the burials. I hope that you've enjoyed this introduction to the church records in Scandinavia. We've made a preliminary review of all the major record types within the church records. And you should know what to expect when you look at those records, and you should feel prepared to jump right into original research of your own. In the final session for this series, we're going to look at how to access church records for your own research. I hope that you'll stick with me for one more round.